What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of One Question for Every Fight here on the Severe MMA YouTube page. I am E. Spencer Kite, your friendly neighborhood Spencer man, and we are here to discuss UFC Kansas City, which takes place this weekend at T-Mobile Center in Kansas City, Missouri. It's headlined by a terrific featherweight matchup between Max Holloway and Arnold Allen, and we're going to dive right in with that fight, with my question being, can Allen finally get that final win? So as you know from, from watching these programs, us talk about Arnold Allen on the preview show and takeaways and the big show and all kinds of different things. We are big Arnold Allen fans here. We believe that he should have been included in the interim title fight that took place in February, it was won by Yair Rodriguez, who felt like sort of a, a rushed entrant into that coming off of one win and that win being by injury TKO against Brian Ortega back in July. Arnold Allen is 10 and 0 in the UFC. He's on a 12 fight winning streak overall and through no fault of his own, he's sort of been the odd man out or the guy that's been kind of always on the back burner. And I need to correct the no fault of his own. It's not his fault that he's been hurt and he's run into issues in terms of making it to the cage routinely, but that's sort of a little bit on him. And and that really has been a big part of what's slowed this climb or delayed this ascension. The 10 fight winning streak has taken place over eight years. If it was over four years, it would be different. If it was over three and a half years or even three years, we're in a totally different situation, but because it's been dragged out so long, it feels like Arnold Allen has struggled to maintain momentum, but he's in a place now on Saturday where if he goes out and gets a win over Max Holloway, a former champion, a guy whose only losses in the last few years are to Alexander Volkanovsky, who in my opinion is the best fighter walking God's green earth today, it sort of becomes undeniable. Now, we say that, and I said that with Arnold when I spoke to him on Tuesday, and we both had a bit of a laugh. I knocked on wood because there always seems to be something that comes up, right? I didn't say it to him, but internally I thought, unless Yair Rodriguez beats Alexander Volkanovsky in July, and then we've got to do a rematch. That would delay his opportunity. But the point being, if you beat Max, if you get that win, there's not really any way to deny him any further. Maybe he has to wait for a situation to clear up, for somebody to get healthy, for, as I said, perhaps a, a rematch between Volkanovsky and Rodriguez, if that goes that way, though I don't see that happening. I think Alexander Volkanovsky wins that fight rather handily. But it would it would be the victory that he needs, right? Every opportunity thus far has has carried a little bit of that yeah, but ability to it. You look at some of the wins earlier in this run, the Gilbert Melendez win, the Makwan Amarkani win back in the day, the Sadiq Youssef win. They all sort of have that element where somebody can go, yeah, but what has that guy done? Or yeah, but Gilbert Melendez was on the decline. Or the Dan Hooker win. Yeah, but Dan Hooker isn't supposed to be at featherweight. He's better off at lightweight. The Calvin Cater victory. Yeah, but he got hurt and we don't know. There's always these these tethers to these matchups, which is why this fight is so important. You go out and you beat Max Holloway, whether it's by close decision, wide decision, finish at some point, you become undeniable, at least in terms of your place in the pecking order. And that's what Arnold Allen is after here. That's what he's seeking. He understands the gravity of this fight. He understands the gravity of this moment. It's another main event. The last one went five minutes and eight seconds because Calvin Cater hurt himself at the end of the first round. And then we were done within eight seconds of the start of the second round. This is the chance. This is the opportunity that Arnold Allen has been quietly working towards this whole time. And I want to see if he can make the most of it on Saturday. Co-main event stays in the featherweight division. Edson Barbosa and Billy Quarantillo. My question is how much longer can Barbosa remain at this level? And I don't say that as a knock on the Brazilian who turned 37 at the start of this year. I ask it as a genuine question because 37-year-olds that are now in their 13th year in the UFC aren't supposed to be, aren't generally hanging around in the lower third of the top 15 or just outside of it, which is where Barbosa finds himself and where he's resided for the last couple of years. Comes into this fight on a two-fight losing streak. He's lost to Bryce Mitchell and Giga Chikadze in his last two outings. He also hasn't fought since last March in that fight with Mitchell. 
because in the run-up to a scheduled bout against Ilya Tapuria, he suffered a knee injury. It is now the longest stretch he has been off in his UFC career between fights. He's never pulled out of a fight before, been injured, fought through it, but this one he couldn't. And when I spoke to him on Tuesday, he said, look, I'm, I'm healthier than I've ever been. I'm in a good spot. I, I don't want to go anywhere. I'm not planning on going anywhere. I'm going to be here for a long time. And I'm curious to see if that's the case. Because for the whole of this 13 years, Edson Barbosa has fought killers. There's a couple guys along the way that maybe don't necessarily live up to that. Debuted against Mike Lulo. There's a win over Rafaela Oliveira in there. Lucas Martins is sort of a quality but underrated guy that earned UFC wins in three weight classes. But for the most part, it's very recognizable names and it's contenders and it's talented fighters. I I did the math of it and wrote it out yesterday. It's two former champions, two former interim title title holders, excuse me, an ultimate fighter winner, two fights with the Irish dragon, Paul Felder, you know, veterans like Jamie, Jamie Varner, who is a former WEC champ, uh, Gilbert Melendez, a former strike force champ, a bunch of good vets like Danny Castillo and Michael Johnson and Dan Hooker as well. And you just wonder how long can somebody like that keep this up? And I think this matchup with Quarantillo is a terrific sort of measuring stick of that. Billy Q is a guy that thus far hasn't been able to break into the top 15 when he's gotten close. It's been the fight with Shane Burgos. It's been the fight with Gavin Tucker. He's someone that can get touched. He can get lit up a little bit. We saw that even in his last fight, a win over Alexander Hernandez. It didn't go great for him in the first round. And then he was able to turn it up and turn it on and get Hernandez out of there in the second. Barbosa is the kind of guy that if he's in shape, if he's ready to go, which from speaking to him, from seeing him yesterday, he's in shape, he's ready to go. Isn't going to let you off the hook. If he gets, gets to you early and he is a quick starter and Billy Q is a bit of a slow starter. That just becomes that avalanche that Rob Font talked about with me a couple weeks ago, um, coming out of the the Cheeto Vera fight going into his win last weekend over Adrian Yanez. It just becomes that tidal wave where you can't catch your breath. And yeah, you get a minute in between the second and third and, or sorry, the first and second or second and third if we get there. But sometimes that's not enough to really reset it. And so I want to see if the 37-year-old Brazilian can really just remain at this point. This is this is traditionally when we see athletes of his age, of his tenure, start taking that step back, start doing the Jim Miller thing, the Andre Arlovsky thing, and saying, I want to still compete. I still love this. I love the process, but I can't hang at this level anymore. So let me take a step back. We'll find out Saturday if, if Barbosa needs to, to go that route. Move to the light heavyweight division, Dustin Jacoby against Azamat Mirzakhanov. My question is, what are we to make of Mirzakhanov at this point? So today is his 34th birthday. Happy birthday. He's 12 and 0 overall. He's 2 and 0 in the UFC. Both of those victories are third round finishes. The first over Tefan Chukwi with a flying knee after he looked to be exhausted. The most recent against Devin Clark in a fight where he pretty well dominated from start to finish. There's room, we talk about this all the time, there's room to move up at light heavyweight. And if if you are the real deal, or even just somebody that can ascend into that lower half of the rankings, there's space for you and it doesn't take too much more. And it may only take a victory over Jacoby here, but I don't know if that's a thing. I, I don't know yet if that's something Mirzakhanov is capable of, in part because I haven't seen it, in part because he's 34 and it's only 12 fights and it's been hit or miss. And it's been eight months since the last appearance. I think it was six months in between Tefan Chukwi and Devin Clark. And so it just feels like there's never any momentum. There's never any immediate carryover progression. And so every time he goes out there, I have to reset my thoughts and get another read and think, okay, now he's beaten Devin Clark. Great. If he had turned around five months, six months even, and gotten this win, gotten a victory over a Dustin Jacoby, then I have an idea because Dustin Jacoby has been really successful overall since returning to the UFC. Seven, one and one now in nine fights. The one is his last fight against Khalil Roundtree Jr., which was a split decision that a lot of people thought Dustin Jacoby won. And so this feels like a great litmus test 
for Mirzakhanov to figure out where he fits in the hierarchy at light heavyweight. And if he's somebody that we're going to have to keep a little bit of an eye on as he continues to progress forward, even if it is at this glacial pace that he's been, been working at these last couple of fights. We stick around the light heavyweight division for Iwan Kutilaba and Tanner Boser. And my question is what does light heavyweight Boser look like? And I don't mean that like physically, legitimately physically, although I do want to see what the big, the big Alberta native looks like at 205, but it's more just, what does he look like in the cage? How does he move? How does he handle himself? Because we saw when he was at heavyweight that he was a quicker guy, a more nimble guy, a more athletic guy in many spots. But then he started doing the shrinking man thing. And last time out, he just didn't have the physicality to get Rodrigo Nascimento off of him. He's somebody that has a wealth of experience. And I think 205 is the right spot for him in terms of his actual body. I think he will look good. He won't look drawn out. It's going to be my guess. He will. He's taken this time to get here, to get here legitimately and, and healthily. But I just don't know what he brings to the table because he couldn't get up from underneath Rodrigo Nascimento. And, and granted, there was 40 pounds difference there. There was a big weight difference and you're underneath a guy that is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu specialist, knows how to keep you on the ground. But it's not like there aren't good wrestlers and good, strong, great, big, hulking human beings like Iwan Kutilaba in this division. I like this matchup because Kutilaba is basically, to me, kind of the floor for who you need to beat in order to have any kind of juice in this division. Right, He's been in there with everybody. Overall, it's a losing record by a number of fights in the UFC, but he can be competitive and he can be a pain to get out of there. And he hits like a truck. And when he's locked in and focused and isn't worried about you know, walking across the cage and screaming in your face during the introductions, he can be a handful. And so Boser needs to have a good showing here. This is a guy that has been bounced in the first round by a bunch of opponents. And so it's sort of incumbent on you, not necessarily to live up to that specific standard, because there have been some, some top 15 guys that have gotten Kutilaba out of there, but to at least show that you are capable and ready to compete and contend and hang out in that upper half of this division, which as I said with Mirzakhanov, is wide open and always hungry for new names and new talent and guys that can maybe build a little momentum and get moving forward. Move to the bantamweight division, my favorite division in the UFC. As you know, Pedro Munoz versus Chris Gutierrez. My question is, can Gutierrez take that next step? It's very weird to talk about an athlete that is on a four fight winning streak and undefeated in his last eight fights as somebody that I don't know where they fit in a division like this. Generally speaking, if you win four straight fights in the UFC, that tells me something. And certainly it has told me something about Chris Gutierrez to this point. But if you get to eight straight without a loss, I'd like to think most times I would have a better sense of where you fit in that hierarchy. But Gutierrez is just one of those guys that I can't really get a read on because those eight fights have largely taken place well outside of the top 15. They've taken place against athletes that have either gone down to flyweight like Cody Durden, and that was the draw, or people that haven't had much success in the UFC like Felipe Kalarish, who has gone back up to featherweight. And for the highlight reel wins and the, and the strong performances like the highlight against Frankie Edgar. It's hard to put a lot of stock in that because it's Frankie Edgar in his retirement fight and about that. None of us really truly thought he should have been taking. And so the streak has carried him into the top 15, but he's gotten there without beating anybody that really solidifies for me that this guy is one of the 15, 16 best bantamweights in the UFC. And given how highly I think of this division and how much I, I love this division and the depth and the quality that it has, I'm really interested to see how he does on Saturday against a guy like Pedro Munoz, who has lost a few fights in a row, is coming in on a rough run. It's one in five in his last six. 
but he's been fighting top 15 opponents this whole time. He is a tenured stalwart of this division. You know what it takes to beat Pedro Munoz. You know who you need to be, what you need to be, what it means to get a victory over this guy. And so Saturday night, Gutierrez can, can silence all the questions. He can answer all of the questions and instantly show that he is seriously a top 15 guy and position himself for an even bigger opportunity next time out further down the line. But it's going to take a really good performance because Pedro Munoz is really good. Last time out, Pedro Munoz won the first round against Sean O'Malley. And then he got poked in the eye and they couldn't continue and things like that. But he is a guy that has been in there, as I said, against nothing but top 10, top 15 opponents, top five opponents in many cases for the last several years. And so if Gutierrez is for real, if this run is legitimate and he just hasn't had his opportunity yet, he gets it on Saturday and he gets the chance to show that that's true. We bounce back to the lightweight division, Clay Guida versus Hafa Garcia. My question is, when does Guida finally ride off into the sunset? Like, let me be clear. This is not a, oh my God, it's time for Clay, Clay Guida to retire question. This is just a like, I'm fascinated because Clay Guida has been in the UFC forever. He is 41 years old. He turns 42 at the end of the year. He's coming in off a win over Scott Holtzman, split decision victory at that. He is one of these dudes that just, I mean, I referred to him in the fight by fight preview that is up on UFC.com as the energizer bunny of the UFC. Like he just keeps going and going and going. And we're going to see on Saturday, he's going to bounce out to the prep point. He's going to be singing probably my hero by the Foo Fighters. He's going to get smacked up in the face by his big brother, Jason. He's going to get in the cage and do his laps and come out bouncing around, bopping around like he always does. He's going to burp in the corner. It's going to be the same Clay Guida that we've been seeing for 15 years. And as I said with Edson Barbosa, guys at this age, at this length of career, don't usually keep sticking around. Now, Guida has taken that step back, right? If you look at his last several fights, the wins have been against fellow veteran guys like Holtzman, like Leo Santos, like Michael Johnson. The losses have come to, most recently, Claudio Poyas, where he got knee barred. And he's facing a guy that's, you know, 15 years younger than him. And so I want to see on Saturday, because Rafa Garcia fits that 28, 29, significantly younger than Clay, on the ascent a little bit, works with some good people in Cub Swanson and, and that crew. This is sort of the one where traditionally, historically of late, Clay Guida drops this fight and Garcia moves forward and, and we figure out a little bit more about Clay. But I'm not ready to sit here and count out the carpenter. I'm not ready. Like, I'm just going to sit here in awe of this dude and continue to sit here and be like, how much longer can he keep doing this? Right? All NFL season, we talked about how much longer can, can Tom Brady keep going? And he finally retired. I wouldn't be surprised if Clay Guida was still fighting in three more years. I wouldn't be surprised if he turned 45 in the octagon and kept fighting. We haven't seen it in a long time. It's It's been a minute since somebody that elderly, that old, and I say that jokingly, I am 44. You can see the gray in the beard. It's even more prominent on the sides. This dude's amazing, man. This dude's amazing. And I know that he never got to full-blown contender status. I know he never won a title, any of those things. But Clay Guida has been an absolute treasure and an absolute joy to watch for the last 10, 12, 15 years. And I just want to see how long it can keep going. Move back to featherweight, Bill Algio and TJ Brown. And my question is, have folks forgiven Bill Algio yet? Like for the longest time, for the start of his UFC run, Bill Algio was essentially simply known as the dude that lost to Brandon Lochnane. And it was held against him that he was in the UFC as if he had some kind of part in this and was supposed to say no to the UFC when they came with an offer because the UFC didn't sign Brendan Lochnane after his win over Algio on the contender series. Since then, Bill Algio has proven that he is the steady, even-handed, well-rounded veteran presence every division needs. He beat Joe Anderson Brito at the start of last year. He fought Andre Feely to a split decision last time out. He's a 500 fighter in the UFC and a guy that is, a, is good everywhere and exactly what you need 
in a division like this and every division. He is the perfect test for a guy like TJ Brown that's coming off a good win, but has struggled to find consistent success in the UFC. He's the perfect guy to face incoming contender series winners like Brito last year, handed him that loss in his debut and Brito has looked very good since. He's the guy that if he gets on a little bit of a run, it can be a little bit like that Damon Jackson run that he had as he went up and got into that scrap with Dan Ige that certainly didn't go well, but you understand what I mean. Like a veteran guy that puts it together and becomes a tough test for one of these top 15 guys needing a reset, needing a rebound. And so I just hope that after several years and Senior Perfecto having nothing to do with it, we've gotten past the point of, can you believe this guy's in the UFC and Brendan Lochnane is not? Brendan Lochnane should have gotten a contract. He should be in the UFC. He is good enough, skilled enough, talented enough to be in the UFC. But the fact that he's not there has nothing to do with Bill Algio. And he shouldn't be held back or besmirched because of it. Brings us to the flyweight matchup. The fight I'm most looking forward to on this card outside of the main event. Brendan Royval, Matias Nicolau. And my question is, what if Nicolau is the best flyweight in the world? And look, I said this in, in talking about Nicolau in Fighters on the Rise, which is up on the UFC website. You can find it on my Twitter on my Twitter feed as well, at Spencer Kite. I know it sounds a little bit blasphemous saying that in a world where, where Brendan Moreno exists and is the champion and has that belt. But here's the thing. Nicolau has a little bit right now for me of that unknown commodity thing. We don't really know where the ceiling is. And he's coming off his best performance in his UFC career. He's had two stints in the UFC. He's seven and one overall. He's won four straight since coming back, including a victory over Manel Cape, including a stoppage win over Matt Schnell last time out. And if he gets a win over Royval here, that puts him maybe not next in line because I do still believe that Alexandre Pantoja is next. And I think that's the fight the UFC will make. It's the one that makes the most sense at the moment. Although every... Every month we get away from that fight being announced, every month that passes with that fight not being announced makes me wonder if it's not coming together for some reason. So I hope we get a, an announcement soon so that we know where the division is going. But Nicolau is just one of those guys that has quietly climbed these ranks up to where he's number five heading into this fight. And if he beats number four in Royval, then he's in the top four and he's right there in the mix. And it would be top three because Davison Figueredo will fall out of the rankings and bounce out of the rankings when he goes to Bantamweight, as he has said he is going to do. And when you're there, it's a crapshoot, right? And he is one of the guys in that division that we don't know the ceiling yet. We don't know whether there's more that we haven't seen or what he looks like against these absolute elite contenders in this division. We haven't seen him in there with Figueredo or Moreno. We haven't seen him in there with even Pantoja. And so this is a guy that at 28, 29, 30 years old, I think he is now trains at Nova Uniao running side by side with his, with his partner, Luana Pinheiro, who got a good win last weekend. Now it's, now it's Matisse's turn. I, like I said, I, I know it's crazy to suggest that maybe this guy that's number four right now or number five right now is the best flyweight in the world. But there was a time not that long ago that Islam Mahashev was ranked four or five or six at lightweight and saying this might be the best lightweight in the world was a little bit crazy, but proved to be true. There was a time when Alexander Volkanovsky was climbing the ranks, when Max Holloway was climbing the ranks at featherweight, were suggesting that they were the best featherweights in the world. Felt a little bit like a reach, like a, a little bit rushed, and it proved to be true. Certainly be, been times where that has been proven false, where I've been wrong on these things. I'm not saying I'm always right. I'm not, not saying this is going to be the case. But I'm just really curious to see if it is. I think he has an abundance of talent. I think he has tremendous amount of skill. And I'm really looking forward to see what he does in a matchup with Royville, who is just, as Harry would say, a mad bastard. And will do all kinds of scrambly things. And bring the best out of Nicolau on Saturday. And I absolutely cannot wait. We move to light heavyweight again. Zach Cummings returns against Ed Herman. And my question is simply, which veteran gets gets to keep on 
gets to keep it moving. So these are two guys that, look, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. They are in the twilight of their career. They are in the back half, the back quarter of their career. They've had some success overall in the UFC. Ed Herman's been here since the Ultimate Fighter season three, which is insane that he's still on the roster and has been here this entire time. Cummins is coming off some injury stuff and some, some time away, but has been here for a number of years now and has had success, had success down at welterweight, moved up to, to middleweight, had a little bit of success there, got some injuries, and now he's back at late heavyweight because why bother cutting weight at this end, especially at this age. This is one of the fights on the card that doesn't really have any stakes. It doesn't really have any narrative to it. It doesn't really have any story to it. It's just two veteran dudes that are going to get out there and bang it out. Zach Cummings, get, Zach Cummings gets a hometown fight and his return to action after a number of months away. Could it be a retirement moment for him if he gets a victory or if he gets a loss? Maybe. I wouldn't be surprised if he says, it's been great. I got to move on to the next thing. Health hasn't been great. Away I go. But it's just going to be one of those fights. Like Ed Herman's somebody that every time he's out there, it's competitive. It's entertaining. He's in there to, to sling hands. He's white as a ghost. So every shot just lights up his body bright pink, a situation I understand extremely well, as you can tell by the splotchiness and the whiteness happens to me. And so this is just one of those fights that I want to see, like who gets to keep it moving? Who's going to grab a victory and move forward in this division and just, you know, keep plugging away at an advanced age for fighters. Again, older than all of these dudes, not age shaming anybody, not being ageist, just saying they're at a point in their career athletically where they generally don't keep competing. And I just want to see which one of these two grizzled old veterans is going to pick up a W and keep going forward. Move to the flyweight division. Jillian Robertson versus Piero Rodriguez. Really interesting fight. And my question is, who's ready to take another step forward? So Robertson has been around the UFC for a number of years now. She's had a bunch of success in terms of her submission game, but she's also struggled in other points where she hasn't been able to get the fight to the floor because the wrestling game isn't necessarily there and the striking certainly isn't on par with, with her submission skills on the ground. Piero Rodriguez, on the other hand, 2-0 in the UFC, undefeated overall, contender series graduate, 30 years old, trains out in Orange County at Black House, does some work at the Ruka Center as well, and is just a, an interesting fighter to me. She's got that toughness and grit and tenacity that I like to see out of any fighter, because those are things that are just, they're unteachable. You, can, you either have them or you don't, right? You can't go out and teach someone to be gritty and to be able to, to weather getting a bunch of shots and being bloodied up and still pressing forward and diving into the fray. You can't teach it. You can't, it's either going to come out of them or it's not. And it, Piero Rodriguez has it in spades, but this is a good matchup because Jillian Robertson is the best fighter she's faced thus far in the UFC. First one was Kay Hansen. Second one was Sammy Hughes, who got a victory last weekend. Shout out to Sammy J. And we're going to see, right? Like this is, it's weird that, that Robertson is a little bit of the litmus test here, is a little bit of the gatekeeper here because she is younger and feels like somebody that still has more room to develop more so than Rodriguez. But because of her stature, because of her tenure in the UFC, she's the gatekeeper. She's the measuring stick. And we're going to see if Rodriguez can stuff the takedown, can keep this standing. And if she can, this feels like a fight where she can look great and go out and style on the savage. But if she can't, she's going to be another person that gets submitted inside the octagon by, by the Canadian who now resides in Orlando, Florida. We move back to the lightweight division, Lando Venata versus Daniel Zell Huber. And my question is, has anyone had a stranger career? The groovy Lando, like good Lord, this guy's UFC career is all over the map. So we all remember it started with a short notice, give him hell fight with Tony Ferguson all those years ago in, I believe it was Sioux Falls, South Dakota, all like seven years ago. Now it'll be seven years this summer. And here's the rundown. And, and look, I'm looking at his topology right now. Lost to Ferguson, win to John McDessie with a spinning wheel kick, lost to David Tamer, 
draw with Bobby Green, lost to Drakkar close, draw with Matt Frivola. First round submission win over Marcos Mariano, who fought once or twice in the UFC and then was bounced. Lost to Mark Jacasey, win over Yancey Medeiros, lost to Bobby Green, drops down to featherweight, split decision win over Mike Grundy that shouldn't have been a split decision. He dominated that fight. Loses to Charles Jordan last time out back a year ago. Gets guillotine choked in the first round. All in all, Lando Venata has four wins in the UFC. He has six losses in the UFC and two draws. Four, six, and two through 12 fights for a guy that you see him compete and it's evident how skilled this guy is, how talented this guy is. And so maybe, look, maybe it's because I've known Lando for a number of years. I've spoken to him many, many times. And I've always thought this is somebody that has a bunch of upside. And if he can string it together, this is somebody that can be not necessarily a title challenger, but somebody that can be in the lower third of the top 15 in whatever weight class he wants to compete in, or just that miserable tough out presence in the middle of sort of the, the second 15, especially at lightweight where he's quick and he's agile and he's scrambly and all these different things, he's good kicking game, very dexterous as a fighter, but it just hasn't ever come together. Like it's just not been there for whatever reasons. And so this is an interesting matchup because Daniel Zell Huber came into his debut as an undefeated fighter coming off the contender series. They did one of those contender series journeys pieces sort of highlighting his, his transition afterwards and his graduation into the UFC. And he lost his debut to Trey Ogden. Now we saw Trey Ogden fight last weekend and, and granted it was a carryover fight after his fight couple of weeks back in San Antonio got canceled. And so it's not necessarily the absolute best version of Trey Ogden, but it's also very representative of who Trey Ogden is as a limited fighter at this level. And Zell Huber couldn't get past him. He just couldn't pull the trigger, but he's a big, long, lanky, dangerous potential opponent that should be ready to go on Saturday. And so are we going to get another weird chapter in the groovy Lando career, or are we going to get a dominant effort from a guy that has always felt just kind of on the cusp of turning that corner and stringing some things together. Next up, Bruna Brazil against Denise Gomes. And my question is, what can Bruna do in her UFC debut? So she might have been had the best performance of last year on the Contender Series. Head kick knockout over Marnik Mann. And I mean, one shot, baseball bat, head kick, walk it off, knockout that sets a certain amount of expectation. And I know that's not fair. I know that winning over somebody on the contender series isn't necessarily representative of what you can do at this level, but she gets a matchup with Denise Gomes, who was also on the contender series, who lost her debut, who is a young, raw, emerging sort of competitor from the Paraná Valley Tudo team, the PVT team, that includes Jessica Andrade and Gomes' partner, Carol Hosa. This is sort of one of those fights where like, okay, you get it. You're going to get a chance here, Bruno Brazil. You're going to get an opportunity to go out and maybe show us a little something that carries us over. So for all the people that didn't watch the Contender Series or only see the highlight or just dismiss it because, hey, it's the Contender Series. What can you do here that sinks the hook for more people as the win on the contender series did for me. Cause I'm in, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I keep my spreadsheets of, of contender series results. And as I've been going through and updating it, she's one of the names that doesn't have a debut filled out there yet from last year. And I've been wondering when we're going to get to see her. It's coming on Saturday and I want to see what she can do in this first trip into the octagon. Next up, Aaron Phillips against Gaston Boylanos. And my question here is why were people so pumped about Boilanos being signed? This is one that I just don't really understand. And I'm, I'm not saying this to be dismissive of him to suggest that he shouldn't be here, but I just don't, I don't see the reason for excitement. So Boilanos is a 30 year old veteran. He's six and three as a mixed martial artist. I understand that he has some kickboxing background, but he struggled against, lower tier guys in Bellator. And so if you've struggled against lower tier guys somewhere else, what is it that is necessarily going to convince me or sell me 
on the fact that you can thrive against even that same level of competition here. Now, he gets Aaron Phillips, who hasn't fought in a couple of years. Last fight was a loss to Jack Shore. He had a bunch of regional fights in between that. Two losses prior to that in his first stint in the UFC. So he's in there with a guy that is 0-3 in the UFC. And so he probably should win this fight. If he is worthy of being at this level, even in the lowest, lowest tier of the UFC, he should win this fight. But I want to see something. Like this is one that I'm interested in just to see what the what the buzz was about, right? Because there were a bunch of people, and I know that my Twitter feed is an echo chamber at times. And it is a bunch of hardcore MMA fans and people that watch everything always and have thoughts and opinions on everybody. And for the most part, whenever somebody gets signed, it's it's about time because they want to see everybody thrive. And so do I. I want to see everybody get the opportunity to make as much money as possible and fight against the best competition and be on the big stage and get their moment in the sun. But I'm also a realist that sits here and goes, I mean, we can't really celebrate and say, man, it's about time that every single fighter that competed for a number of fights on the regional circuit gets to the UFC because we can't have everybody here, right? This is the thing we talk about all the time. Roster's too bloated. There's too many guys. If that's the case, we can't be celebrating and going crazy and excited. And it's about time for every single person that gets there. And so I want to see why it is beneficial to have Gaston Boylanos, the dream killer on the roster going forward. Last one, opener of the night, Jocelyn Edwards, Lucia Pudilova. And my question is, are Pudilova's improvements legit? So she struggled in her first run in the UFC. It just wasn't good. She just wasn't ready. She was raw. She was young. It just wasn't there. She's training at SBG Ireland now. She had a bunch of success overall under the Octagon MMA banner. In between these two stints, she returned to the UFC late last year, got a victory. It was a good performance. She got a stoppage. She looked like an improved fighter. You could see the development of now 28-year-old Lucia Pudilova versus 21, 22, 23-year-old Lucia Pudilova when she was here before that victory was over Wu Yanan. Edwards is a good test. She's got some range. She's got some length. She's been in there a few times, comfortable in the octagon, knows what she's doing. She's comfortable being in this opening spot, which is a weird spot, right? Some people may not jive with it very well. Some people may not like it very well. They want to get to the arena and sort of get into things. And this is the like, Hey, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. It's your turn to go fight, which is a weird time sometimes. And so I want to see if, if the win over Wu Yanan and the finish and the ability to advance to some of these positions that she advanced to and show that development continues because at 28, we might be talking about somebody that can string some stuff together, right? Like she's six and one in her last seven, since the end of that first stint in the UFC, the losses to Toledo Bernardo, who fought in the UFC and has had some success in Invicta, like she's done well. And if she beats Jocelyn Edwards, who is a, a good, competent fighter for this division, for the UFC overall, that's two straight inside the octagon. And now we're talking about, okay, this is a fighter that needed that time that we talk about all the time, right? It's not until you get to 27, 28, 29 that we start seeing the full, complete, real version of these athletes, the fully actualized version of these athletes. And so I want to see if that's what we're getting to with Lucia Pudilova on Saturday. That does it for the show. I will be back tomorrow with 10 things. Ian and I will be back. The magpie and I will be back on Friday with severe picks and plays. I'm telling you, he's, he is the magpie. That name is now stuck because I was on a nice little winning streak, turning profits over all the weeks that he was gone. He rolls back into town, shows back up on the show, and I lose money. The Magpie, Ian O'Neill. But that's on Friday. We will be back later in the week with the preview show. Myself, Ian, Harry, maybe Sean. We'll see. All kinds of stuff coming to the website. All kinds of stuff coming to this YouTube page. So please subscribe, like, leave us comments. Check out all the lads on Twitter. Sign up for the Patreon. It is the best collection of content in the business severemma.com forward slash pints the best url in the business as well follow me on twitter at spencer kite know that you're loved 
Know that you're appreciated. Have a great day. Have a great rest of the week. And we'll see you soon.